no longer bound in distant years to Palestine, he comes to claim the here and now to conquer every place and time. It's Easter, isn't it? We're in the Easter season. Our readings are pointing us toward the reality of the resurrection, Christ breaking through into our lives. You know the place I came from a week or so ago? Greece? It's an Orthodox country. Do you know what day it is in their church calendar? Easter. It's Easter today. <laughs> I did. We finally got out of Lent. I was over there and right back into Lent. It was an amazing, and it has been an amazing journey. And I apologize. It's really hard to pull a sermon together with so much sermon material. I'm torn between being able to convey the message that we should be looking for, anticipating, expecting Christ to break forth, the resurrection to come into our lives, and taking you on a Brooks and Steve's great adventure. <laughs> Travel on. So how do I going to put those two together? I'll try. I want to first introduce you to somebody, and uh, Judy Schneider, who's a deacon in the Episcopal Church, does it. she might know this because she's been around a while. Mark, Mark knows it now. Do you know who this guy is? Kind of hard to see. He's a, he's a saint in the Orthodox Church. Anybody ever heard the name Fenurius? Saint Fenurius. This icon, this picture, which I apologize, but only, I didn't get a picture of this. I could only get these off the internet. This one is the original icon. We don't know the date of that icon. This is a modern adaptation of what the iconographer painted sometime well over 500 years ago. This icon contains every piece of information that's known about Fenurius. One person on the internet said it shows you the flexibility of the Orthodox Church in selecting saints that they can canonize a guy about whom we know so little. He's a Roman soldier. He's holding a cross with a flame coming out of it. Other earlier versions, he's holding a cross in one hand and a candle in the other hand. Around the central figure are 12 scenes, one of them being brought before a Roman judge and asked to recant his faith. He's being stoned, he's being bitten with sticks, he's being stretched on a rack, He's being buried under piles of rubble, and finally he's burned. An icon that says this guy, this Roman soldier who lived sometime during the Roman time, was severely persecuted and martyred and never wavered in his faith. But what's so important about the icon? How did this guy become a saint? What's the story behind the icon? that really is interesting. It was on the island of Rhodes, Greece. I went to Rhodes first to have a couple of days for myself so I could get on a ferry, go north to Patmos, and Brooks would come down from Samos on a ferry and meet me on Patmos. That was the plan. <laughs> I said the one week, week link in all of our transportation plans were the Greek ferries. Right. Two days the Samos ferries were canceled, so we both flew back to Athens and went on to Thessaloniki and never made it to Patmos. But here I am on Rhodes. I came to see the usual things. You know, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, the Palace of the Grand Masters, the ancient medieval walled city. Instead, I found Fenurius. I didn't know the story of the icon. I simply know that when I walked into this little guest house, three room guest house in the middle of the old city, met my Austrian hostess, gave me a recommendation on a place to have dinner. She said, What would you like for breakfast? I said, well, what are my options? She said, I have an idea. I could make you a phanaropata. What's a phanaropata? Oh, it's a little cake they make in honor of St. Fenurius. And it's made with oil, no butter or eggs, so it's okay to make it in Lent. Okay. I'll put it in a bowl with some nice Greek yogurt, and I'm going to mix pumpkin oil and pumpkin seeds in there and baked apples. It was a delicious breakfast. But now you've got my attention. Who's St. Fenorius? Well, this is St. Fenorius Street. We just came in off of St. Fenorius Street. His church is just down there. Oh, 
Maybe I should go see Tenorius' church. I found the church. I said in Vail, it's probably one-third the size of the Vail Chapel. I wouldn't even begin to guess how to... Just a small little thing. It's got a round cylindrical dome back there that you can just see over the... Oh, the corrugated roofing over the main barrel part of it and the siding here. It's closed. I go back to the guest house. Oh, it can't be closed. Go back at 4 o'clock. They'll be open. Go back at 4 o'clock. Closed. Okay, take a few pictures of it. I come back. I'm sitting around in the lobby there, and Yuta's helper says, Bells, I hear the bells. The church is open. You better go now. I run down there, and I walk into an Eastern Orthodox service. Anybody ever been to one of those services? Icons, the screen. There's a big hulking priest with his back to us, chanting back there somewhere. There's icons all over the place. There's candles, and people are milling about. People are going around, kissing icons, buying candles, lighting candles, coming and going, leaving during the service, and the service just goes on. Okay, I guess it's okay to come in in the last 15 minutes. Service ends. I push my way forward, and this one icon on the side with all this silver on it, People are kissing the heck out of that one, man. I'm staring at this icon that we know is at least 500 years old. I'm in St. Venerius' church. And as I'm about to leave, a woman comes up to me with a little foil wrap piece of thing. And guess what she handed me? A piece of fan rope event. Everybody that came to service got one. Now you've got my curiosities. So I go back to the hotel. Excellent Wi-Fi in the three-room guest house in the 650-year-old building in, in Rhodes. Don't try it at the Hilton Miami Airport. <laughs> and I get the story. Sometime after the time of the Knights, which ended in 1522, the Arabs had defeated them. And in the battle, the walls got kind of beat up. So they were out scavenging rocks to repair the walls. And they came to this ruined church. They started scavenging rocks. And all of a sudden, they uncovered a pile of icons. They were all just horribly destroyed. You couldn't even read or just make out who they are. But in the middle of one, there was this totally pristine, untouched, as if it had been painted the day before, icon. And so began this story. The Bishop of Rhodes was called. He looked at this. He said, look at these scenes. I we know his name. It says, right over here, it says Fenurius. Wow. I'm going to petition to have him make his, made, made a saint. This is all we know, literally, about this man. But it shows a man who was tortured and murdered for his faith and never wavered in his faith. He needs to be a saint. Now, if you're a saint, you have to be a saint of something, don't you? What would Fenurius be the patron saint of? Patron saint of things that are hidden and come to light. The patron saint of lost articles. Okay, here's the mundane version. Make a fan of rope and take it to the church, get it blessed, bring it home, go to sleep, and that night you'll dream about where you put your car keys. <laughs> <laughs> How about a slightly more expensive version of that? The name Phanurius in Greek translates to one who reveals. Perhaps a spiritual insight that you've been listening looking for is revealed and uncovered to you. Perhaps a way to approach mending a relationship is uncovered to you. Fenurius, the revealer. That's what I found on Rose. I was not coming looking for Fenurius. I had no idea he was there. But he found me. Little was I to know that this was going to be a harbinger of things to come. Because for the rest of the trip, God was breaking through and revealing to me and to Brooks things that we had never expected to see, to the point that the end of my time with Brooks, we had just been to the Agora in Athens, we climbed up Mars Hill. That's where we're sitting in the picture on the back of your cover, by the way. You can come back to that. The Parthenon Necropolis is behind us. 
We found a little place just outside the fence to have lunch, and I needed to go get a cab to the airport. And I saw people walking up and going around behind the building and the fence there. I said, oh, oh, Joe's just around there. I'll just follow around the fence, and I won't get lost that way. So we parted. I turned. I went about a block, and there's a building blocking my way, so I have to go back down to the street and go around. Next corner, I look up, and there's some stairs, and I see the fence. Okay, I'm going back to the fence. I walk up the fence. There's a sign with an arrow. Church of the Metamorphosis. Do you know the Greek word for transfiguration? Metamorphosis. The Church of the Transfiguration, right there on the street, up against the Acropolis, this tiny little church. So I text books. You won't believe this. Three minutes after I leave you, I find the Church of the Transfiguration here. And he kicks back. Oh my God. The Church of the Transfiguration, right up against the Acropolis? Wait. You have enough sermon material. Quit. <laughs> It's how it went. It's how the whole trip went. We didn't make it to Patmos. We ended up with two extra days in Thessalonica, a city we did not want to go to and spend a lot of time. A million people, all kinds of modern buildings, a few ruins that they've dug up in the middle of the place. Two days later, we were exhausted from all of the things we packed into there. We went to the ancient Roman Agra. We went to the museums, two incredibly beautiful museums archaeology and Byzantine culture. We saw at least 300,000 icons. And we went to the Arch of Galerius, the emperor who persecuted Christians some later time. And we were walking through the arch, taking some pictures, and we spotted just at the end of the building there a very familiar sign. Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks in Thessaloniki. So we're headed there. Okay, we're going to go have a coffee. Wait a minute. What? There's a church. Look at that church. It's a beautiful church. I know it's in Greek, but I still can't translate it. Later, somebody translated it for it. Oh, the church of Mary on the right. Mary on the right? I didn't know Mary was a conservative. <laughs> no, the icon in there, Mary is on Jesus. Jesus is on Mary's right hand, not his left hand. So check out the icons and see how many times he's on the right instead of on the left. So we walk in, there's this beautiful barrel ceiling in the nave, and we look up, look up, and oh my gosh, look at that beautiful fresco of transfiguration. <laughs> oh my gosh. We punks around, Brooks has to ask, finally, up there on the left, that guy with the real, real stern look on his face, that's Paul. Oh, okay, so we found Paul. Good. So we could go out with some other things. One of the things that Brooks had done on his pilgrimage, and I said I wanted to continue with him, is to read the letters that Paul wrote in the cities that he wrote them to. <coughs> He'd been to Colossae and sat on top of the hill where nothing's been excavated. I told him not to go there because nothing was excavated. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to read Colossians on that hill. And it was a good, good time. So we're trying to decide all these things in the two days in Thessalonica. Where shall we go and read Thessalonians? How about the church of Mary on the right that we weren't looking for? And if we sit over here on the side, we can look up and we can see the transfiguration. And if we look to our left, Paul is staring us down. <laughs> Seems like a great place. So we read them out loud, each of us reading a chapter. Incredible, incredible experience. So it's very hard to describe what it felt like just be there, doing it. The next day, Elaney, a guy that I found online, who we prayed existed, uh, for a very reasonable price, agreed to drive us to Philippi, which is about two hours away. She insisted we go to Kabbalah, which is a seaport town of Neapolis, in the reading you just heard, where Paul landed. So we go up there, we go to first to Philippi. Where do you want to go first in Philippi? Do you want to go to the ruins or do you want to go up the road to where Lydia was baptized? Let's go up the road to where Lydia was baptized. Why not? We've got plenty of time to climb around the ruins. So we walk into this beautiful park-like area. Green grass, trees, 
a stream flowing down one side, a little island has been created with an icon of Lydia, a little channel with steps down so you can do baptisms in the running water there. A nice octagonal church over here. But wait, what's going on? Something's going on here. People are handing, hanging blue and white hearts from the trees. They're putting blue bunting over the bushes. There's a guy over here setting up a refreshment stand with blue and white or something on it. The lady says, they're baptizing the boy. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it'd be big for girls? Yes, it would be big for girls. <laughs> we came to the site of Lydia's baptism the first European Christian. And you know what they were doing? They were having a baptism. How, no, not coincidental, is that? That meant the church was open so we could go in and see the church. I took pictures of all of these beautiful frescoes of different scenes of baptism from the Bible. Brooks, I don't think, ever made it inside the church because he was standing in this mosaic floor that had all of Paul's journeys his entire pilgrimage on the floor. He must have taken a hundred pictures of that floor. I was just astounded that had that church been closed, we'd never have seen that floor. That would come at another time. We came back later. Baptism was over. Everything was gone. The church was shut up. After doing the ruins of Philippi, we decided sitting by that running water was the place to read Philippians. And so we came. The lady... Brooks and I, not a single other soul there. And we sat there and read Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And we commented on how different it was in tone from the letter to the Thessalonians. Paul was writing from two different places, two different times in his life, and the tone of the letter took us through so vividly different. So, back to Kabbalah. We have to go to Kabbalah. We got to late lunch in Kabbalah. We have to let Laney show us some things around Minneapolis. We parked the car, which was not an easy task because there were a lot of cars. And we get out of the car and we start walking, following Laney. And we just walked down the street, crossed over. And Brooke said, Look, the man from Macedonia. I'm sorry, Jim. It's Macedonia. Some of <laughs> I would have done it too. This mosaic on the back of this church, it's kind of hard to see. On the left side in the shadow, and actually that's actually shadow because that's where the sun was shining at that time today. Paul is over in Asia Minor. He's despairing about getting out of Asia Minor. He, every time he turns to go a direction, God says, don't go that way. And he has this vision, this man, the man in the blue in the middle, this guy from Macedonia, says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then in the sunlight on the right, Paul is stepping off the boat in Kabbalah, Minneapolis, to begin his journey up to Philippi. Great. We've seen Lydia's baptism site. We've seen, we found the man from Macedonia. Gosh, we weren't looking for him either. We didn't know that church was there. We didn't know there was anything in Kabbalah. We didn't even want to go to Kabbalah and spend any time. So Elaine says, well, let's go around and see what's going on. This is the back of the church. We walk smack dab into another, this was not a, our second time, this was about our fifth time, another service in progress. This was a Sunday evening service with communion. There are groups of men, like six men on either side, chanting, the most beautiful chanting you've ever heard. I see Brooks reach for his phone, I did the same thing, I'm like, yeah. We just turned that little voice memo thing on, you know, and record some of this. And he was quicker than I was. By the time I got done fumbling around, the chant had ended. And Brooks was looking at this guy and nudging me. Ethan, where did that guy come from? He was behind the screen. He comes out with the whitest stole I've ever seen. And it's going this way. And I said, got our answer, don't we? We were wondering whether the Orthodox Church had deacons. I know the answer. They do. <laughs> there he was. And he chanted for five minutes. And the choir guys would respond. And Brooks goes, prayers of the people. Yeah, I <laughs> think so. So we found the man from Macedonia and a deacon in the Orthodox Church in Kabbalah. We 
we return to Athens, and I had that similar experience with the Church of the Transfiguration. But what I'm trying to say to you is, I should have known when I found Phanurgus what this trip was going to be like. At every turn, there was something we were told, or a lady took us to a little monastery, we went into the morning service, we stood there for five seconds and spotted the icon of the Transfiguration prominently displayed just to the left of the front door. I should have known. Traveling on a sabbatical like this, traveling with our minds open, God's going to break through. Paul knew, despite his bad mood in writing for Thessalonians when he's sitting in Athens and really in a funk, he knew 99% of the time, he wouldn't wonder if God was going to show up. He didn't hope God was going to show up. He knew God was going to show up. He expected to find results. He comes to Philippi, a city that doesn't even have a synagogue. You know, he goes to the other cities and he starts teaching in the synagogue. He's got a guaranteed audience. He finds some people. Because there's no synagogue, they went outside the town to find some running water. That would be the place that you would pray if there's no synagogue. And here's Lydia, a wealthy woman. And she responds immediately to his teaching and says, baptize me and all my household. I think at this Easter time, the question I have is, how open are you to God breaking through? Do you expect to find God, to have Him influencing your life. I like to start most days, most days because I don't always remember every day, with that colic, one colic that I really like. Almighty God, you brought me in safety this new day. Preserve me with your mighty power that I may not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And direct me in all that I do to the fulfilling of your purposes. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Expect God to show up. It's Easter. The resurrection is real. And I have so much more about that trip. <laughs> That's just kind of skimming the surface, really. It's just, it was a wonderful experience and a really privilege to be with Brooks and share that time with him. Just that short segment in Greece that I had not done before. <laughs>